So as I'm walking back to my driver's side, I notice this guy pops out. What, what, what did you hit me for? What did you hit me for? And I'm like, you know, what's the problem? And all I can see is the top piece of what I'm assuming to be a rifle. Listen up, gang. If you've not heard of Big Tech's ordinance on the internet, you've got to check it out. Ike and his team are wildly popular in the shooting and self-defense community because they are committed to providing the greatest selection of top shelf gear at a fair price, supported by knowledgeable staff and undisputedly the best customer service in the industry. Please thank them for their support of this active self-protection podcast by considering them for any of your gear needs and let them prove to you why they have an almost fanatical fan base of their own. Please visit BigTextOrdinance.com, BigTextOrdinance.com, and let them know the Ask Podcast sent you. All right, again, welcome back to the Active Self-Protection Podcast. I am your host, Mike Williver, your favorite former Fed with us today, a new friend of mine who will call Frank. Uh, we're getting a lot of aliases lately, a lot of names <laughs> redacted. It makes it kind of makes it more intriguing, more mysterious. But uh, <laughs> Frank is in his 30s. He uh, currently lives in the great American Southeast. This is the beautiful South. There are pine trees where he lives. There are thunderstorms where he lives and very nice people. Awesome. He is uh, he's recently engaged. So congratulations to him on that. Uh, Frank, thanks so much for being here, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, uh, I love the show and i um, glad to be a part of it and any information I can you know share with the community. Absolutely. So as I say, I've said before in this space, you know, we, we don't, not every single one of our uh, episodes is going to be out a super, about a super duper successful uh, self-defense encounter. Sometimes just living through it is, is as much success as you can hope for. Not every time do our self-defenders have the tools and equipment or the awareness or preparedness to do all the things you'd hope they'd be able to do. But these are stories that need to be told because I think a lot of people listening to this show and watching the YouTube channel are doing that because they don't know what they don't know and they're finding it right. to be educational. So uh, talk to us, Frank, about your background growing up. Where, can, you, can you tell us what state you grew up in? Do you mind telling us that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind about that. Um, I'm originally from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I moved there when I was five, five six, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm basically from there as far as I'm concerned. I uh, went to school in Savannah and that's when I first got my, uh, carry permit, which got me into like seriously into the world of self-defense and stuff like that. Before that, I'd taken karate and stuff like that as a kid, but never anything that serious. Like nobody in my family was a police officer or military or anything like that. Um, I moved to California in was right after I graduated. So it was about 2009. I'm sorry. And I was sorry. out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Hat moving to California. <laughs> no one warned you. No, I mean, it was, you know, it was for the career. I'm, I'm a visual effects artist. So that was the place to be, especially fresh out of school. You know, I didn't want to be pinned into one company or something like that. Sure. So I um, moved out there really just for the options. Um, and actually having to give up the right to carry was something that I was uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I decided, um, let's try this and see how this is. You know, I had never been on that side of the country before. So I was willing to see if there was uh, some functionality in that. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Uh, so anyway, I was out there for about, because this happened in 2014. So about five years before this took place. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was uh, August 14th. Um. I was coming home from, I think it was a friend's birthday party. I remember being downtown. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I was coming home from a friend's birthday party. So it was late in the evening, about 1130 or something like that. Um, and I was around the corner from my house. So I'm basically in my neighborhood, a very familiar area. I feel comfortable. Um, the Outwater Village area, for anybody that's familiar, it's kind of close to Echo Park, Silver Lake. It used to be maybe 10 years ago before I moved there, it used to be a pretty active gang area. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I moved there, it settled down basically, or supposedly right. <laughs> it, it had settled down a bit. Uh, so anyway, I was sitting at the traffic light at the corner of Hyperion and Glendale. And that that's important because of the way those streets operate. Okay. Like Glendale goes up on a ramp above back into Silver Lake and everything like that. Gotcha. And Hyperion continues on into Glendale and they loop around each other. So you can basically go underneath one of the streets while you're still on Hyperion. It like makes a little loop. Um, so I'm sitting at the intersection prepared to make a U-turn to go back around underneath Glendale 
to stop at a taco truck that I know is always on this corner to get some food before I'm headed Critical home. to know. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. I, I had to get my food. Like, right. that's why I was, <laughs> making, you know, out here instead of just heading home. But um, I, I made the turn and there was a car in front of me, a, uh, a Honda wagon with tinted windows. Um, but it didn't look like anything suspicious. It just, you know, a grandma's car kind of deal. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't loud. It didn't have people hanging out of it or anything that would, you know, uh, spark your attention. But okay. he was in front of me at the light. We both made the U-turn. Uh, and as I'm coming around the turn, I noticed that he was a little unsteady is the best way to put it. It seemed like maybe he was intoxicated. Maybe he didn't know I was there or he couldn't see me or something. And he kind of swerved into my lane. And um, I hit the brakes pretty hard and he let him get in front of me. And I was like, okay, he wanted to be in this lane, not the right lane, so that's fine. I go around him, go to the right lane. And I'm, I would rather be in front of people that are driving erratically mm -hmm. than behind them in case they hit something and you know, whatever. Right. Uh, so I was trying to pass him before that loop occurred. And to the right of that loop is the five freeway. So if you can imagine the freeway is on our right, I'm in the right-hand lane. He's in the left-hand lane, just about a car length ahead of me. And we're both appro approaching the corner uh, to go left. Um, just at the last minute, as we're approaching the freeway on-ramp, he cuts over into my lane, and I have to hit the brakes to avoid hitting him. But we're traveling at such a rate of speed that it's inevitable. But I'm slowing down as we make contact. And that essentially kind of puts him in a pit maneuver almost. He spins out right in front of me and then comes to a stop on my passenger side. Okay. Um, my windows were tinted, but they're not like dark, dark. Not they're limo just, tint, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not crazy tinted, but they're dark enough that in that area where we were, because the only light source is street lights now, there's one up above on Glendale, and then there's one right where we are at our surface level, and then that's the only light. Okay. So I'm looking out the window, and I see a person open up the door, hop out, and book it and right over there is um what's that thing called again the la oh yeah the, the la river yeah yeah is right next to us made, so made of made of concrete if you're not from la it's exactly. not really a river it's just right a, it's you, a big valley made of concrete yeah and where we are uh it's not very, there's not a whole lot of water you can traverse it there's, unless it floods you can walk across mm -hmm. so this guy takes off books it hops a fence and he's down in the river somewhere before I can register what's going on that I'm in it, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 it. So I figured that was the driver because I couldn't really see where he came from. And I just assumed, okay, he doesn't have a, a driver's license or insurance or whatever, because you know, where we are. So I'm a little bit more lackadaisical when I'm getting out of the car, because I'm assuming I'm by myself now. It's right. just this other guy and I'm gonna have to call the cops and whatever. I get out. I take about three steps forward and take a look at the damage to my car because he made contact on my driver's side uh, quarter panel and mm -hmm. corner light. So I'm coming up, you know, taking a look. The corner light's cracked. The uh, fender is bent onto the wheel. So it's not, it's not, the wheel hasn't broken, but it's rubbing. It's like making contact, right? right? So I take a look at that. I'm like, okay, I have to deal with this. As soon as I look up, I notice that there's a guy what I'm realizing is on the driver's side of that car, because it's spun around now. So our cars are facing opposite directions. Okay. I'm still facing the way we were driving and they are facing opposite, but in the little, so uh, the Chevron section. So you're face, you facing each other almost. Yes, exactly. Okay. But we're sitting next to each other. Okay, I got you. You know what I mean? Okay. So as I'm walking back to my driver's side, I notice this guy pops out from what is their driver's side, because I can't see into the car because the windows are black. Mm -hmm. Pops out and he's like, what, what, what did you hit me for? What did you hit me for? And I'm like, you know, what's the problem? And all I can see is the top piece of what I'm assuming to be a rifle. Because I can't see, it's not a butt stock. I can't see uh, the body of the rifle or anything that would trigger them in my mind that this is definitely a rifle, but I'm not going to play with him. And right. you know what I mean? At the time, I was telling myself, I was like, this is probably not a rifle because of the way, how he wasn't showing it. It was mm -hmm. like he was behind the car. He was moving around. But again, I wanted to take him seriously. So I put my hands up and immediately started moving towards my car. He's like, oh, you're going to pay for this. Give me a wallet. Give me your money. You know, stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, okay. I'm walking towards my car, hands up. And uh, in my mind, I wanted to keep as much of the car 
cars in between us as possible in case he started to shoot. So I've got either cover or something. You right. know what I mean? Sure. It's just me and him out there and give me somewhere to run or go, whatever I was going to do. Uh, so I'm walking, keeping that angle right. I make it to my uh, my driver's side door. The car is still running, by the way. I didn't turn my car off, but his car had stalled out. So I get in my car, and at this point now, my passenger window is cracked, maybe three quarters of the way down. So I have a clear line of sight out of that, no window center or anything. Mm-hmm. And he's now walked around his car, and he's at my passenger side. And I'm still going along with the, hey, I'm going to, you know, I got you. I'm getting my wallet. I'm fiddling with my center console, uh, which is right next to my emergency brake. My I had a uh, a manual transmission, a 328 CI manual transmission. Nice. Six speed, right? Uh, so I'm I'm next to the emergency brake because in my mind, I had already kind of laid out a plan. If anybody ever tries to carjack me, the second that muzzle is not on me, I'm putting the first gear, dump the clutch, and good luck. Like, if, if you can hit me and I'm moving that fast, you know, more power to you, but it's unlikely. So I was looking out the window, and now I knew this was actually a gun because I could see the whole body of the frame. I was like, okay, this is some kind of rifle, or AK, something like that. Mm-hmm. I still can't get a full uh, picture of it, so I don't know exactly what it is, but it was enough for me to know. It ain't good, not- whatever it is. Yeah, yeah I don't want to be on the other end of that. Right. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking through the window, and I see that he's fiddling with the magazine. So in my mind, I go, okay. It's not loaded. There's nothing in the chamber or possibly only one round in the chamber. I'm willing to take that gamble. I slam the emergency brake down, put it in first gear and just drop the clutch. I noticed there was somebody coming down that right lane now just out of my peripheral because I guess I was kind of in a little bit of a tunnel vision state okay. when I'm looking out the window at him. Um, but we weren't in danger of colliding. I just knew he was there. Like I could feel there was another car. I remember looking out the window and seeing the guy and he hadn't looked at me or the other. He see, it seemed like he just assumed this was a regular accident. So I guess he didn't know what was going on. So I took off. I like ducked down behind the the uh, the seats and as much as I could to try to in case he got that it got that magazine in and wanted to start shooting. Sure. I just had a straight shot. I didn't have anywhere to go. Ducked down behind that. Made it down to the end where I could make a left-hand turn to get out of his line of fire. Uh, and then, you know, three left-hand turns, made it back home, put my car in the garage, and uh, called the cops after that. They came. How long did it take them to get there? Before we get to that, actually, I, do, I have a question. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. wondering if these guys, and this may come out later in this conversation. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if these guys thought you were plainclothes cop and had, they had just committed a crime and perhaps you had pit maneuvered them intentionally. And that's why the first guy bailed out and ran because normally after a normal car accident, one's instinct is not to run. Even if you don't have insurance, like getting out and jumping right. into the LA river seems like a bit much. What, what do you think? Is that a possibility? I, when I was talking to my parents about this afterwards, they were very convinced that there was some other motive. They, they thought they were trying to, you know, cause I had a nicer car. Mm-hmm. So they thought that they had, noticed me when they were sitting in front and they were going to try to hit me off the road. And t- I just, I thought that that was kind of extreme, especially considering because it it's a small street. There's not a lot of space. And, and you don't want to damage the car like, you're about to steal if you don't have to. Yeah. That. And then also it's just like to believe you could do that uh, efficiently. It just, it just seemed far fetched to me. Um, what I, I It'll come out more so later in the story, but I think it just came down to them being intoxicated and uh, in a very illegal situation. That dude, had, that know, dude had hundred percent. That dude had a warrant. Anyway, moving yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They definitely had some kind of warrants or something like that. The car that they were in wasn't theirs. There was a rifle in the back seat, which is extremely illegal in California. Um, they were intoxicated. Like, there's just a lot, and then they just got in a car collision. So, right. And he wasn't like he turned out the guy that ran turned out to be the passenger. Okay. So he was less involved with he's like, Well, I'm just gonna get out of here because you know. I'm gonna ask you to profile Frank real quick. Do okay. these guys look like gang members to you? Okay, so there's two parts to that. One, it was dark. I did not get a very clear look at any of them in the moment. I saw them later on in the trial and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, 
and they looked different then because they had been, you know, Cleaned time up. had passed. Like, yeah, they cleaned yeah, up. Yeah, time nicely. had passed and all sorts of stuff had happened. Um, but in the moment, I don't think I got enough information to make that assessment. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Because I was, yeah, I was in the car. It was dark. I, The description I gave to the officers after the fact of the guy that ran was really just his physicality. I didn't, I couldn't really see his face because I saw the back of his head because he was running. I said, he's about this tall. He was wearing a dark shirt and, you know, blue jeans. Right. You know, he's a, a lankier person, but that was about it. Um, and I'll bring that up again later too, because when I was in the courtroom, I thought I saw him again, but I wasn't sure because I never got a clear look sure. at him. So, so you get yeah. home uh, after after this incident. I'm sure you're probably pretty amped up in that moment uh you call you call the police let's talk about that um mm -hmm. it can be very frustrating sometimes for people who aren't familiar with the 911 and how it works how, how long it takes to you know you want the police here now uh you call 911 what's uh, what's that experience like um well actually i'll take a, a slight step back the first thing that i did when i got home after i parked my car was i took out my phone and my voice recorder and i just gave a quick rundown of everything that just happened because I wanted to have, I do have a good memory. Mm -hmm. I have what some would call like a photographic memory, but I still wanted to, as fresh as it was, it just happened. I just got home five minutes ago. I wanted to have that audio record. So I just quickly pulled out my phone, recorded what I saw, what happened to me, where I was going, what I was doing, just any kind of information or questions somebody might ask me later in case that I forgot about it or whatever. You know what I mean? Sure. I just wanted to have that. So I did that. Then I called the police. Um, I told them what happened. They said, okay, we, we have a, another report of something similar to that. Um, you know, some officers are already in the area. They'll be to your, I gave them my address. They'll be to your house soon. Um, I went, I had a dog at the time. So I went back in the house and he said, you know, dogs sense energy. So sure. he's kind of, I come in the house like that and he's bouncing off the wall. He's a pit bull too. So I was like, let me put him in his crate because I know the officers are coming over and I don't want that to be an issue. Right. So I, I got him situated. Um, I did have my firearm out there, even though I'm not allowed to carry, you, you can own firearms, you know, you just have to register them. So I did get that because I didn't know where this guy was and what his intentions were, if he, how much information he had, you know, I just didn't know. So I would rather be prepared than not prepared. Um, the cops came, I think in, it didn't take them long. I want to say between five and seven minutes. Okay. Um, when they got there, the first officer, he was trying to ask me sequence of events. And so I was explaining to him, he hit me on the road, he spun out, he got out, you know, one guy ran, the other guy pulled the rifle. I said, you know, and he kept asking me the same series of questions. And my initial thought was that he didn't believe me or that he thought, uh, I was some, in some other way involved, mm -hmm. you know, in the scenario. But um, in hindsight, what he ended up explaining to me was they got another call about this same guy. Um, apparently, after I left and made it back home, he got back in his car and went around that circle and went back the same way that we had initially started or tried to go back that same way. Uh, pinballed his car off the, the bridge and just left it there. Got out with his rifle, walked down into the neighborhood because you can access those neighborhoods uh, from the sidewalk there mm -hmm. and robbed two other people that were whatever, walking their dog or something like that. Charming. And those, those people called first while I was, so that was happening while I was en route back right. to my house. They called first. That was, then that's why when I called 911, oh, we have a call that was similar to that. It was them. So they were trying to figure out, well, who got robbed first or you know, who was the first person that made contact. And, and an, another, person. another thing uh, I speak from experience, as you know, uh, I will always ask a suspect, a uh, witness or a victim to, to recount the story at least two or three times. There's two reasons for that. One is in case they are full of baloney and they're telling you a story that isn't true, uh, things will change significantly. More often than not, what will happen the second or third time is they'll remember something that they hadn't remembered the first time. And it could be critically important, that information. So that's one of the reasons right. why a law enforcement officer will do that. Okay. So they're, they're standing in your house and you're tell, you tell them the story. Uh, walk to walk us through what happened after that. Uh, yeah, actually, we didn't. I didn't even take them inside because my dog was I had a very small place, Los Angeles, uh -huh. <laughs> and my dog was right there. Like there was nowhere we could go where he was not going to be aware of them. 
So we just stayed out in my driveway, which was still secluded. It wasn't like we were on the street, but and it was easier for them because they were going back and forth and trying to figure out what was happening. And, you know, three of the officers that initially made contact with me left to go down to the scene. And another guy came in an SUV and he was taking more information. Um, and eventually they wanted to bring me back to uh, the first scene of the, the accident to try to figure out if it was his car, because there wasn't a whole lot of uh, way to identify because it was the car wasn't registered to him. He didn't have a driver's license, anything like that. Uh, so when we got back, I gave them the description of what he was wearing, um, which was a like uh, football jersey, like football jersey or baseball jersey hmm. uh, with big blue lettering. I described it as blue lettering. Um, and they, when we got there, they all had their you know mag lights, which are like that seventy five k that white light. Mm-hmm. And they pulled the jersey out the back, and it looked like it was a what's it a uh, Miami Dolphins. Okay. So it's like green and that like turquoise green with an mm-hmm. orange stripe. And they're like, well, I mean, I know you said he had a jersey, but this isn't quite the right color. So I don't know. And I was like, turn your uh, your flashlights off for a second, because now we're back under the street lights, which are orange. Mm-hmm. And Sure enough, that neutralized that color and it goes back to blue, and everybody saw it happen. So oh, they're like, oh, okay, cool. yeah, they're like, that's that's what he was wearing. Because if you describe it as dark blue, and any one of us would also describe it as dark blue in this lighting, so that's, that's fascinating, very wearing. interesting. Um, and they were from that deduction, they were able to tie him to both um, incidences. I mean, I, it was obvious to me what happened, but I guess for legal purposes, they need to be able to say this is definitely his car. Right. He definitely hit him first. He definitely left his car here. Then he went down, you know, sequence mm-hmm. of events kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, all that was was taken care of in about an hour, an hour or some change, because it was all near my house. So it was a small, uh, like a small area, I guess. They didn't have to go far. Um, yeah, I think I'm trying to remember the rest of that night. I do know I didn't sleep that night. Sure. I was de- yeah, I was definitely up. Like I, I tried, but I was not. <laughs> yeah, I, I was not sleeping that night. So to be um, clear, do they get him into custody that night or no? No, okay. that's another part of why I didn't sleep. They did. Uh, they were familiar with him because, like I said before, this is a former gang area, but it's not like a hot spot anymore. Right. But, you know, when you it, cut the head off the snake, the rest of the guys, they kind of they're still there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But they're just not organized anymore. Um, and that's who I believe I ran into was one of the guys who was kind of a lower ranks, not, you know, big deal and whatever, whatever, and was just out on, uh, you know, out messing around. Really. Out, do, out yeah. doing crimes? Yeah. Basically, he, you know, he had a gun in the back. He's drinking or whatever. I think they may have found uh, uh, a, a malt liquor bottle in there. Shocking. Uh, yeah, an empty one. That's something else, too, that I did notice is... I, I don't think it was alcohol. You could tell there was something different about him. Like looking at his eyes, he didn't seem like he was here in the same way that so I was. Different or... than being different than being drunk. Different kind of. Yeah, faded. yeah. It was different than being drunk, and his uh, his level of mobility was too much for somebody that was intoxicated enough to think this is the right course of action. Right. You know, I would right. expect there to be some kind of stumbling or he was moving too fast for that. So I, you know, I'm guessing maybe it could have been uh, methamphetamines or something like that because it was around the time when that started to be an issue in Los Angeles, but it wasn't publicized yet. Right. So I don't know. Yeah, could I'm be. Guessing. So when do they end up uh, catching this guy and, and how are you made aware of the fact uh, that he's in custody? Let's see. Just, uh, pro- uh, you know, if you don't remember the exact date, it's fine. Just approximately think, how long? I think it was about three days primarily because they were familiar with him. So the the initial officers that I got contacted with were just, you know, regular patrol. Within about a day, um, like gang unit contacted me and they came to my house in the morning, like before I went to work or something, showed me some mugshots. I told them who, you know, it was obvious. That was something that I also didn't expect. I thought that the pictures that, you, that they compare you with or that they give for you to compare would be closer, but from my perspective, because I, I knew what the guy looked like, I was not going to forget his face. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It was obvious who I had dealt with that night. Um, so yeah, I pointed him out, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we know this guy. Like he's never done anything this serious, um, but we've definitely had contact with him. We'll find him. Got to like, start you know. somewhere." Yeah, yeah. So it was that, and once that went out, once they knew who it was, one hundred percent, 
I think it took him about two days, two and a half days. I don't know where or how they found him, but they picked him up somewhere. And how do they inform you of this? Does someone come to your house? Do they call you? Uh, the same detectives actually that came to my house in the morning. Uh, I think, I think he called me because he, he gave me his card and all that kind of stuff. I think he gave me a phone call, let me know that they had caught him. Um, and then after that, there was the court proceeding stuff. He was following up to when I was available to come in. I don't think it went to a full trial. It was only a preliminary trial, uh, but I did have to show up for that. So Okay, so you went to a prelim. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you give testimony? Uh, yes. Okay, and what, what was, was he in the room, and what was that like? He was in the room. Uh, the first thing that I noticed was that he, how do I describe this? He felt much smaller, if that's mm, the best way to put that's, it. That's really interesting. Okay. And I, some of it was his physicality. Um, I guess, you know, maybe you're not eating as good when you're sitting in jail. Because he had been in jail for about three months by this time. You know, so it had been a little while before we got to the, the point where I saw him again. Uh, so that may have been part of it. May have actually lost a little weight. But I also think, you know, because he's not the dynamics have changed he doesn't have a rifle we're in a courtroom he's technically in shackles and it's not you know the level of intimidation i guess had flatlined and we're both just regular people so but now that i'm looking at him that way you know so he he's not menacing he's not looking at you funny or anything like that no he i, I don't think he looked at me now that you bring that up i don't think that he looked at me yeah the reason the reason i ask and I always try to avoid making any part of the podcast about me, but this is a pretty good story. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a downstairs neighbor when I lived in uh, in SoCal in San Diego County, and uh -huh. one night he and I was just a new a newly minted federal agent, and he's downstairs one night, gets really drunk, and starts just beating the ever living crap out of his girlfriend and mm. stepson or her mm. her son, I should say, a little boy. Right. Call nine one one, and I'm really trying to not get involved with something that literally is right next door to me. But the PD mm -hmm. was taking way too long to get there. And I finally knocked on the door and he comes out and he's screaming and yelling at me. But at least he's not screaming and yelling at them anymore and throwing him against the wall. Anyway, right. he says, hey, did you call the police? And I said, yeah, dude, everyone like literally everyone in this apartment complex has called the police by now. It was very loud what you were doing. Right. He says, you better watch your back, rookie or something like that. And, and storms off into the darkness, mm -hmm. never to be heard from again. Well, like nine months later, I get a call from the DA saying, Hey, he's in custody, but the, his girlfriend and son to their credit split, they left the state. They're out. Like they're nowhere to be found. Right. We can't find them. We want to charge him with witness intimidation. So would you be willing to testify? I said, sure. Uh -huh. So I go in and I'm sitting on the, in the, you know, sitting in the witness box and the DA is saying, what happened? Tell me about it. And I'm, I'm recounting the story. And the whole time this dude is just staring daggers at me and making all these faces <laughs> about now he's full of baloney, whatever. Right. That actually, I think that actually swayed the judge into convicting him of uh, witness intimidation or witness tampering, uh -huh. which is a serious, it's a felony. It's a serious felony. And huh. he ended up going away for like 18 months, which I was, I was shocked. So that's why I asked the question, was the guy looking at you funny? So you, you say, no, okay. he wasn't at all even looking at you. No, no. And I didn't know that that could be used against him. So maybe that was a part of it. Cause it's, I mean, he did have an attorney. Yeah. So. It's a bad look. I'm sure the attorney told him to be very careful not to do that. Right. Okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I, I thought that, um, okay, this is kind of changing my perspective on the whole thing. That's why we're here. Yeah. My initial thing, because obviously as soon as I found out who he was, I looked him up, you know, Google, whatever. Sure. I just want to see who this guy is. He lives in my neighborhood or my area. Cause I, I think, I don't think the police gave me his address, but I think I got it in the insurance claim process. Because I got the insurance, I mean, the address of the other well, driver. A copy of his driver's license. Somehow I got his address. I obviously wasn't supposed to have it, but right. somehow I got it. And uh, I discovered that he lived in my neighborhood. You know what I mean? So I, I, before they found him, I was definitely very much on edge. I had a feeling that he lived around there just based off the way that he behaved and the way that that guy took off and ran into the, the L.A. River like that. Because mm -hmm. I used to walk my dog down there. And I know, I was like, the only people that would feel comfortable doing that at night is somebody who's around here a lot and you know where you are in reference to 
the other neighborhoods when you come back out. You know what I mean? So, so allow me to go on a bit of a tangent here. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, moving to California, the one thing you didn't like was the fact that you would almost certainly not be granted a concealed weapons permit and you wouldn't be able to carry a firearm. Uh-huh. I'm not going to ask you if you carried a firearm illegally after this incident, but do you feel like, um, in the aftermath of this incident, now you know that he's this guy's a criminal. You know he was armed. You know he has a propensity for violence. He threatened you with a firearm, mm-hmm. and now he knows that you're the one of the chief witnesses in this in this case. You know, do you do you feel like you had you been able to carry that you would have in the aftermath of this, at least in between the time he is, you know, arraigned and sentenced and put away in jail? Right. <clears throat> well. That's, I'm glad you asked me that actually, because that's kind of, there's two answers to that. So the first part of it is if I had been allowed to carry, I would have been carrying the night that that happened, right? The way that my mind processed the information in the moment, I strongly doubt I would not have drawn on him Mm -hmm. because I'm quick. I'm, I'm athletic. Like I do, uh, I do Muay Thai now. I'm, you know, I train with my firearms, even when I don't carry them, dry fire, just drilling. I find it entertaining and it's good to, you know, Absolutely. know how to use the tools. You sure. know what I mean? So I felt confident in my ability at that point. And I hadn't even gotten to the level of where I am now. I hadn't done the training that I had done, but still I felt like where we were, I had a solid backstop because we were underneath an underpass. So there was just concrete and steel basically mm-hmm. and worms of dirt going back up into the neighborhoods. So I wasn't too concerned if, if I was going to miss or, it, you know, I I really feel like I would have drawn down and fired because he had a gun out already and he was threatening me. Mm-hmm. Um, the downside of that is that I probably would have killed somebody and had to deal with all of the aftermath that comes with that, convincing the police that show up that I'm not a threat, you know what I mean? Because... We're just sitting on literally we're on the side of the road mm-hmm. and there's a dead guy with a, you know what i mean sure and who spun out cars making it past that to the trial and then the aftermath of his family and friends because if this guy is you know a gang member or affiliated or affiliated in some manner i have to deal with god knows who that all live around me looking for me basically because they know who i am they can show up to the court case and see what i look like or get my name and address mm-hmm. So there's two sides to that. You know, I was glad it ended the way that it did where I got home safe. I didn't have to hurt anybody and he didn't hurt anybody, you know, other than the, the tra- trauma from the incidents for everybody involved. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, it's interesting. I'm glad that I'm where I am in my life, but I also feel like if I had my firearm. Um, I would have drawn and fired on him. That said, if you could have, let's say you, you know, everything happened the way it did, and you didn't, we weren't carrying that night, but mm-hmm. you had the ability to carry in between after the incident went down and the end of the court case, would you have carried during that period of time? One hundred percent. I actually, until I got the call that that he had been caught, I didn't really leave my house because I knew I couldn't go anywhere um, unarmed. And like I, you know, I had a dog. I used to walk my dog within a mile or two mile radius of where that incident happened. Right. And in my mind, I'm like, there's somebody that knows what I look like, that I have a slight idea of what they look like, and they may have a lot of friends. And I, was, I would rather not <laughs> leave a place where I can't defend myself. You know what I mean? Because I know they're willing to to enact that type of force. So. so real quick, walk us through the rest of the trial. And I assume he was convicted and sentenced. So walk us through how that, what that looked like and yeah. what your participation in that was. Okay. Um, so the the trial that I went to was a preliminary trial. It didn't actually go to full trial because of the amount of evidence. There ended up being three witnesses. So myself and the other two uh, individuals that he robbed. Um, we all were in attendance at the court case. There was nobody else really in the courtroom except for one, two younger women and then one guy who to me resembled the body profile that I had of the guy that jumped out and ran. Interesting. So I felt like, I mean, you know, your mind does weird things. I could have just been making that up. It could have just been his cousin or his brother or whatever. But in my mind, that was the other guy that got out and ran and just I was the only person that knew, right? right? So, uh, so he's sitting in the back of the courtroom, the, uh, the, I don't know what you want to call him, the defendant. Sure. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Knuckle, okay. Knucklehead, defendant. defendant, whatever. <laughs> yeah. 
he's he's sitting to my right, um, and then his attorney is questioning me about the event. Like he's from my perspective, he was trying to trip me up on details. He was double checking the street that we were on. That's what they do? He pulled out a map and he wanted me to point exactly to where it happened. So I just made sure that I was very deliberate and intentional with what I was saying because I didn't want to uh, bolster up charges or anything like that. But I also didn't want them to think I'm lying or, or you know what I mean, or yeah. lessen the situation either. I just wanted the truth. That, this that's is what 50% happened. of what a defense attorney does is try to discredit witnesses. And they don't care right. who you are. And they don't care how that might affect you personally, by the way. Right, right. So, yeah, it was pretty simple. And then there was one question he asked me at the end. I can't remember, but I, I felt that it was a trip up question. So I paused for a good so enough time for the judge to ask me to respond. So it's, it's like <laughs> a when did you stop beating your wife question? Something like that. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> it was something that I knew that he's trying to get a specific answer. So I need to phrase this properly so that my answer is still adequate. And let me let me give this piece of advice to our listeners who might find themselves in this position. You can ask to have the question repeated and you can take as long as you want. You're under there's no timer on how soon you answer a question when you're on the witness stand. You can't obviously just sit there forever and not answer it. But right. uh and if you take your time and ask for the question to be repeated, what that does is it gives your attorney, whether whether you're on the prosecution or defense, it gives your attorney or your attorneys a moment to think about the question being asked and potentially object to that question and not have to answer it at all. Uh, so mm -hmm. just just a little fun uh, legal tip for our listeners going moving on. Yeah, that's good. to know. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, yeah, the, the, the judge asked me to respond i explained i was like i just want to make sure i give you guys the right answer if you just give me another and she was fine she wasn't you know pressuring she's okay that's fine and then i did eventually respond um and then that was it i think uh the other two witnesses went after me so they were in the hallway and the detective uh the same detective that i had been in contact with the whole time he was there also he shook my hand he said if, you know if anything else comes up i'll let you know i said okay cool um, I was on the lookout for the other guy that I had seen in the courtroom. I was worried about him following me back to my car or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how real or unreal that was, but it's not, it's not impossible, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I do remember thinking about that a lot. Um, but yeah, after the court case in terms of, uh, it being on the forefront of my mind, it significantly decreased. Like once I knew what was going to happen to him and, all of that kind of stuff, it definitely settled down a lot. Um, sure. So at, at, yeah. this, at this point, the I assume you're notified that he's he's pled guilty. He pled guilty to something at some point, right? Uh, I think what did they? I think what happened was they gave him a plea deal. So instead of actually going to court, which he's risking, I think the minimum because of the the firearm because the charges. Where's my paper? I can tell you the charges. Sure. They gave him. Sure. Three counts of robbery and three counts of assault with a firearm. That's right. Okay, so this is what happened. They counted my interaction as a robbery because he tried to take my wallet. Mm -hmm. But after discussion with the officers later, once they found out that he didn't actually get my wallet, and obviously his attorney is fighting against that, that got reduced uh, to two counts of robbery and three assault with a rifle. I mean, assault with a weapon, mm -hmm. which in California just automatically shifts the whole... Uh, penalty box Sentencing, or whatever yeah. you want to call it into a different world. You know what I mean? So he's just because he had the firearm, he was looking at nine to 20 something years for each charge. So he just pled out and I think they gave him 12 years. That's pretty good in California, dude. I'm here to tell you. I, yeah. I, and I, in California, that's I, I took a lot of my cases state instead of fed just for, for various reasons. But 12 right. years in California, that's that's a long, pretty long sentence. But he didn't, well, he was recently released, so I don't, because what year is this now? 2022, 2014. Doesn't mean he's going to do 12 years, right? But Right. Yeah. It didn't, and I think the minimum, I think the minimum was six, so I think he ended up doing the minimum. But, um, but yeah, I mean, interesting event for me. It was very interesting, eye-opening. Uh, and I definitely, what it did do for me was cement my original mentality about uh, self-defense and protection. I was like, okay, yeah, no, this is not real. The idea that, well, if most people are not carrying firearms, it's going to be, I was like, no, because 
this guy had something that was completely and totally illegal, like the whole thing. It wasn't, you know, because of the way he had it, where he had it, the type of rifle it was, everything about it, by their standards, he should not have been allowed to have, but he did, and we were in a random place. It wasn't like I went to his house or went looking for this trouble. Right. So, it, yeah, it really cemented to me that here we, you know, it's important to be able to defend yourself. So uh, was this LAPD or LASO? Uh, LAPD. Okay. So I assume you watch active self-protection badge cams from time to time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I do. So I, watch, you, I, I watch a lot of those videos. So, you know, usually they, they get a pretty good score. LAPD does pretty well most of the time. Um, and mm -hmm. they were always been a proud organization. I think after the events, the Rodney King events and a few other things, um, they had a, a federal, I can't remember what it's called. It's like a federal mandate from the Department of Justice to say, look, we're going to keep an eye on you for a while until you guys sort yourselves out as it relates to right. various and sundry things to include racial profiling and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And they have, in recent years, I've only worked with them a couple times, but in recent years, they just seem to be extremely squared away, extremely organized, extremely well-trained. What kind of grade would you give them thinking back to the, the initial response to the end of the trial with the detectives? What kind of, what score would you give LAPD as far as how they handle this whole thing? Um, okay, so this is going to be, that's an interesting question. I'm glad you asked me that. Interacting with the LAPD in an emergency situation like that was actually far less painless than I thought it was going to be. And the reason that I say that is because up until this point, I had been in several car accidents and because Los Angeles, people can't drive in Los Angeles. <laughs> that's true. Right? You're going to get hit. It's just part of being there. So up until that point, that's the majority of how I dealt with the police. And in those scenarios, it's much more difficult. They take longer to get there. They're not very, uh, you know, communicative and understandingly so. They have a lot of other things to be dealing with. But that was all I had dealt with up until that point. Um, but you know, like I said, they got there pretty quickly. Four minutes from an incident like that, as far as I'm concerned, I know they're not going to be there immediately. You know what I mean? Um, they were all once they established that I wasn't somebody involved with it they were all very polite um respectful the guy like when they needed to take me back over to the scene he came to my house and picked me up because they had already dropped me off and they oh okay everything's cool you'll get a call from the detective tomorrow and then so it was maybe about an hour or 30 minutes later when he came back and got me um you know they were just they're pretty nice guys i didn't yeah those officers were cool i didn't have any problem with them so I get the sense from some of the things you said earlier that after subsequent to this event, uh, you decided to start training and take your training more seriously. But let me ask you this first before we get into that. Okay. Would you say that part of the reason you moved away from the Southern California area and back to the Southeast was this incident and the fact that you couldn't, were not probably going to get a CCW? Was that part of your decision to move? Uh, it factored in, but it wasn't a motivating factor. So okay. When I say that, basically, it was the state of Los Angeles as a whole. Of course, my fiance, or new fiance now, she's already in this area, so it was easier. Like, we met during the pandemic, when, and we were on opposite sides of the country. Um, she was in a work position where she couldn't work remotely, and I could. So I was like, okay, one of us has to move. This place is rapidly changing from how it was when I moved here, because I came there in 2009. Yeah, so I, I kind of yeah, saw I the whole shift. Uh, and it was very gradual. It wasn't, you know, until those last few years after the the uh, pandemic and everything that mm -hmm. took a sharp left turn. Um, but yeah, it was, it's the state of everything. I always had a problem with not being able to carry. And once I got back to an area where I could, I realized that it was actually a small source of anxiety for me. Um, because just being in public, being around that many people, that many, um, oddly behaving people because Los Angeles is full of all different types of characters. You know what I mean? So I, I know what you mean. Yeah. You just don't know who you're going to run into. So it's that you can't even rely on, okay, at least most of the people that I'm going to run into are going to have some semblance of my line of logic, not even, you know, systems of belief or anything, but just don't hurt somebody. Don't, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Basic stuff. <laughs> I don't know that that's going to be there. Um, and, and then, yeah, then just kind of the, anti uh anti-firearm attitude for most people that live there not everybody because there is a community but you just you, they kind of keep to themselves um but yeah it just I, I i never felt comfortable being my full self because a part of myself is 
self-defense and sure. protection, you know, and just that's a part of my mentality. It always has been. So with that being said, let's talk about uh, training afterwards. You walk us through. Did you did you start taking self-defense training while you're still in L.A.? And what did that look like? Um, OK, so my first what I would say uh, serious firearms training course was um, Front Sight in Nevada. I don't know if they're still there. They might be. I believe so. Um, say what now? I believe so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. It's it's a great place. I I learned a lot there. It's fun. Um, but it's far from me now because I'm all the way on the other side. But if you're in that West Coast kind of area, I would definitely recommend check it out. Um, but I did their four day uh, defensive pistol course, um, and I lucked out in. I wasn't partnered with these guys, but they were right next to me, and I had. Yeah, both of them were MPs in Iraq, and one of them was a sh deputy sheriff in San Diego, I think. Um, both of them had attended that course several times. Um, the deputy sheriff, it was just a part of his training regiment. He would go do that four-day course and just, I'm going to work on trigger press today. I'm going to work on presentation, but for the whole four days. Mm -hmm. So he was very familiar with the course. Uh, so I got a lot. I felt like it was almost like a cheat sheet. Like I got ahead of a lot of other people in the class because they would just tell me. They're like, oh, do this. This is how this works. Do this. Do. So I feel like I got more out of it than most people probably would in a four-day course. Um, they have the way that their graduation system works. It's designed for you to fail, like not in a bad way, but they want you to really have a solid set of the skills before you move on to the next course. Um, so they have like graduation distinguished graduate which is what's required to move on to the next course and most people will either graduate or be just below graduation and i managed to be i think i was one round off of distinguished graduation nice I, one round and i, and I remember it happening because I, I got too cocky i was like oh we're close i got this it'll, it'll hit the box yeah. i don't need to look yeah. and it was a flyer yeah so <laughs> but uh yeah so with, with that said, I just want to quickly plug our national, I don't know if you heard of our national conference, but it is every year in September. There are still openings. I would love to see you there if you can swing it. Um, it is in Manhattan, Kansas, and it okay. is September, I believe, 23, 24, 25. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and okay. um, it's all for a good cause. It is to help support the Flint Hills uh, Foster Teen Summer Camp, which is a really cool okay. thing. They get to take these kids through um foster camp and give them free spots because of the conference so there are world-class firearms trainers there you can avail yourself of all kinds of stuff and i don't remember how much it is off the top of my head but it is a screaming good deal for training considering how much stuff goes on there plus you get to hear me sing worship music so do you get like a, a live fire training stuff like that too, oh absolutely like... yep oh okay. yeah so check that out for sure Okay, uh, so what other kinds of training would, have you done since uh, since this incident, if any? Um, so we had front sight. Other than that, it's really just been maintaining those that skill set that sure. I got there. Uh, one thing that I took away that I really changed how I trained and the level of accuracy accuracy that I was looking for um, was during the like the classroom sessions. They talked about how you know under stress situations your groupings are going to be about twice the size of what it is when you're normally at the range, taking your time, totally relaxed. So their methodology for dealing with that was that if at the range, at whatever distance you're training at, moving, not moving, whatever, you can keep your groups about the size of your hand. Um, that's going to, in a stress situation or a defensive situation, you're still going to get hits. They may not be exactly where you want them, but a hit is better than no hit, I'm assuming. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so, uh, the, the hits and misses do not do not end gunfights, as we say. Right, exactly. Misses don't end gunfights. So, uh, I've really taken that to heart, and I feel like that has improved my shooting a lot. Um, I am looking for some uh, shotgun courses, though, and some long gun stuff because fan, most yeah. of what I've been doing has been focused around uh, my handguns, and because I carry, and I want to be as proficient with that as I can. So, you know, I do that. I do. I do, you know, drawing dry fire, dry fire practice almost every day. I don't think I go more than two days uh, without getting the reps in because it just it it feels awkward to me sure. to not, you know, know that I can uh, unconsciously unholster my weapon, you know, because 
I yeah, we call, we call it being world. unconsciously competent at a at a skill. Yeah, to where it's just automatic. Wait, say it again. Say it again. Uh, we call it being unconsciously competent at a skill to where you there there is zero thought. There's only stimulus and response. Right. That's that's how I, I that's what I'm looking to achieve. So right. that's why my uh, my regimen is so regular. But uh, well, Frank, we're about out of time. I do want to ask about um, PTS. Have you suffered any? Has this incident left you with any sort of um, you know, sleeplessness, hypervigilance, anything like that. If you don't mind, right. you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. Yeah, no, I, I don't mind. Um, actually, now that you mention it, this was the first time that I understood what PTSD was for some people or and how severe it could be or not be. So in the first few days when they didn't, they hadn't caught him. So this was maybe the second night. I'm still, I'm at my apartment by myself. Um, I lived with somebody else at the time, but they weren't home. They were out of town. So I'm at my kitchen. I'm cooking. I remember looking out the the living room window to see, you know, my driveway. There's nothing there. Nobody, no light, no motion. I look back at the pan. And you know how you kind of have like a residual memory of what you just looked at? You know, yep. where you see what's on the TV screen, whatever. So I look at the pan. I'm recounting what I looked at. And in my mind, it switched to that guy. He popped up in my window, just his head. And it, it felt so real that I ducked. I felt like he was there. I was like, oh, no, I saw him. He's in my window. I ducked and I looked back and there was nothing there. So I was like, oh, okay, this is what people mean when they have flashbacks and it feels like you're there. It, like I responded, yeah, my heart started running. I, you know, I just went into reaction mode. Um, it was only that one time uh, it, it definitely subsided after, you know, they knew where he was and I knew where he was at least and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. Very cool. Well, Frank, um, you know, I consider you a friend. You got my email. I'm going to get you my number. Anything I can do for you, let me know. And uh, if I'm ever out your way, and I will be at some point, I'm definitely going to look you up. Vice versa, if you can find yourself in Arizona, man, hit me up. We'll get a, we'll get a beer or, or coffee or something or maybe lunch. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate you telling your story. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Yeah, of course. No problem. All righty, gang. Welcome back to the Gutowski Files, featuring, also starring Stephen Gutowski. He is the founder of TheReload.com, TheReload.com, and the host of the weekly Reload podcast, which is available. It's just available everywhere, okay? Not finer, not less fine podcast. It's just you can listen to it. Go listen to it. It's a great show. And uh, check it out on YouTube. And consider becoming a member at TheReload.com to help Stephen continue his important work and to get that podcast a day early. Stephen, how are you, sir? Doing well. Yeah, we, we don't hide that podcast. It's out there. It is. It's it out is. there in the ether. People it, can find it pretty easy. Yeah, you should subscribe to Active Self Protection, Active Self Protection Extra, and the Reload on, on YouTube. And the reason why is uh, he's got a ton of short clips and stuff you can watch over there that are really interesting, kind of the, the meat and potatoes of the interviews. So you can check out a little bit at a time or watch a, a whole podcast. I highly recommend it. Today, we are discussing um, a rather unfortunate bill signed into law in the state of California. And it, it is, uh, I'll let Stephen um, describe it in greater detail, but basically it's, it's trying to ban advertising uh, for firearms, firearms related content to minors. And that has had a rather unfortunate side effect of closing down what uh, something that I participated in as a child, which is a, a, a clay target league, the California State High School Clay Target League in particular. And uh, that's too bad. Turns out that is, if you read the article over at the Reload, it's 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 the safest sport there is. It's safer than tennis, people. It's safer than football by by a, lo a long way as far as injuries reported uh, by students. So, Stephen, tell us what's going on. What are these people in California up to now? Yeah, so this was a law that was mm, sold as being a ban on advertising guns to children, uh, to minors. Uh, but unfortunately, the way it's written is quite broad, and so it actually affects advertising in a way that is um, designed, intended, or, quote, reasonably appears to be attractive to minors, any firearms-related product. Mm. And so you can see how this has uh, effectively destroyed the youth shooting sports in california altogether because i mean whether you're talking hunting or skeet shooting rifle shooting you know the, these clay leagues that are actually growing in popularity around the country over the last several years uh effectively 
kids in California are now cut off from all of that because this law makes it uh, so that anybody who's uh, seen as potentially advertising t- anything firearms related towards children, any sort of product, uh, could face huge fines from the state uh, over this law. And so what that's done is forced these leagues to shut down. Um, <clears throat> and now I'm working on a story that well, will likely be published by the time this episode airs uh, at the reload uh, about how that's affected some of the youth shooters in California. One in particular, her name is Lola Fitzgerald, and she is one of the top female youth shooters in the country, actually. And now she's had coaches withdraw from working with her because of this law. Uh, She's been shut out of the competition scene across the country, not just in California, but across the country. Uh, You know, she's effectively having her dreams of becoming an Olympic shooter, something that has given her uh, achievements to this point is actually a realistic possibility for her uh, dashed by by what's going on here. And so it's it's had much broader impacts, I think, than anyone in California government expected it to, perhaps. They, they don't seem to have intended to do this, given some of the public statements they've made. But this is the reality of, of how this law is, has come down. You know, Stephen, I don't know about you, but I grew up uh, with my grandfather taking me clay shooting, target shooting, you know, with a Ruger um, 22 rifle, that sort of thing, uh, plinking cans. This sort of uh, instruction, I think, uh, makes the world a much safer place than it otherwise might be. It's the ability to expose young people to firearms in a responsible way with a mature, reasonable, seasoned firearms instructor, someone to guide them along, uh, is, is it's a shame that that's being curtailed in, in any way, shape, or form. But more, more to the point here, uh, the young lady you mentioned, you know, I, I don't know if people know this, but a lot of our uh, our, our sh- Olympic shooting teams have been pretty dominant uh, throughout history. And one yep. of the ways people come up, you know, there's there's no little league, that, or I should say, this is kind of like little league and college for people who are into shooting sports. And again, we're we're never going to get rid of all the guns, folks. The, the guns are out there. So the idea that that uh, curtailing education and training on how to use them responsibly in, in a prudent manner seems like a bad idea. Now, I, I don't know that the people of the legislature and the governor of California intended for this to happen. If they didn't, uh, it'd be nice to see them go back and maybe do some kind of amendment. Is that something you think is possible, Stephen? I think that's possible. I mean, I, I will say that obviously... You can just read this law, the text of it. Uh, the, the law was um, AB 2571, and we have it linked in, in one of our pieces as well. But uh, you can read the text of it and understand why it's having this this outcome. I mean, this is talking about uh, anyone related to the firearms industry in any way, essentially, advertising about any firearms-related product, meaning just literally any. I mean, shooting league would be a firearms-related product. Sure. Um, you know, if you pay to in, get involved in a shooting league, that's a firearms related, certainly, and uh, a product. And, uh, you know, and and the extremely broad language of this, you know, it, it's clear why this this is having the effect it is, whether or not Governor uh, Newsom uh, understood that that's what would happen when he when he signed the law. Uh, but but yes, I do think there's a strong possibility it could be repealed. I think there's an even stronger possibility that it's going to get struck down in court very soon. There's already a lot piled against this bill, uh, really on First Amendment grounds more than anything else. Uh, California has tried to do these sorts of uh, advertising limits in the past, uh, you know, in an extreme cases, you know, they, they've tried to basically force gun stores to remove the fact that they sell guns on their own windows and and so forth Uh, you know they they, they've passed laws in the past that have taken extreme approach to regulating gun advertising and they've lost on first amendment grounds and it does seem like this is a case where uh the the gun rights groups involved the second amendment foundation um the california rifle and pistol association they're they're pretty confident that this is not going to survive for very long, uh, mainly because of the First Amendment implications of it. And so they have a preliminary injunction request already filed, a motion for preliminary injunction, and that's going to set 
that's set to have a hearing. I believe it's August 21st. So in a couple of weeks, and I would expect that they will get that injunction, but even, you know, and I, I could see some sort of amendment being made that maybe excludes explicitly shooting leagues, uh, given the way that, um, the governor and attorney general have, and, and the sponsor of the bill have reacted to its effects and, you know, essentially just wiping out the entire youth shooting sports, uh, operation throughout the, one, the largest state in the country. So, um, yeah, I don't think this is going to last very long the way it is now. Do you get the sense, Stephen, that this is, uh, in, in anything that the governor or attorney general or sponsor has said that this wasn't in fact an unintended consequence and they have any desire to go back and amend this to, so we can continue these sort of shooting leaks? Y yes. I think, you know, you've, you've seen them uh, give statements that effectively contest the idea that uh, this law does affect shooting leagues. Um, and so, you know, effectively they're saying that's not, what it does uh, of course again if you just read the the text of the bill it's very broad to see why yeah why this happened um and so you know well, i i i think in california you're much more likely to see the court force this law to be either repealed or or amended in some way uh, than you are to have the California legislature fix things, but it's not impossible that that could happen given how disastrous the enforcement has been to this point. They have now that, you know, they haven't tried to find any of these groups yet uh, under this law. You, you get the feeling that it was definitely intended to be more of a symbolic thing. But the problem with that, of course, is like, it's a real law with real, uh, fines. I believe the fine is up to twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, and I, I don't want to be the guy that tests the theory that it's symbolic. You know what I mean? And, and the, going to jail or being or being fined by the state. And the other problem with it too is even if it is short lived, as I'm expecting it to be, as I'm sort of predicting here, you know, it still has a serious effect on people like uh, Lola Fitzgerald. Sure. Like, you know, she's got two more years until college. She's had colleges. Colleges offer sh scholarships for for shooting, uh, for their shooting teams. Like that's a common thing, especially uh, female shooters. Uh, female shooting teams at colleges have become much more popular in recent years. Their scholarship based programs in a lot of places, and she had been recruited by several schools uh, in the run up to this law, and now they aren't talking to her anymore because they're afraid of liability from this law. Uh, because you know, if they if you, if you send a, a pamphlet into California that's you know encouraging a, a minor to join your shooting program at your college, it's very easy to see from the text of this law how you might uh, have have crossed into legal liability by doing that, uh, and that that's the problem. Like you it might not be illegal to hold uh, youth shooting events in California. But it's illegal to talk about doing it right. or to advertise the fact that you're having one. That's effectively what this law does. And, and so, you know, there's even uh, Chuck Michelle, who's the head of uh, California Rifle and Pistol Association, said that uh, Bass Pro Shops has stopped selling teddy bears that had shirts that say, uh, you know, my, my daddy's a, a hunter on them because of this law. Uh, so, you know, look... Uh, does the AG charge somebody for buying one of those teddy for selling or buying one of those teddy bears? No, but you can understand why uh, a company might not want to take the risk of getting a giant fine levied against them. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I don't want to be the person who who the test case um, to to get on the wrong side of this law, symbolic or not. A couple of things, Stephen. I assume you're in contact with uh, young Miss Fitzgerald. You've interviewed her. Yeah, you? I have an interview coming with her. Uh, shortly. We'll check that out on the reload on folks when, when it comes out, probably, probably Friday the 12th, if I'm guessing, uh, or thereabouts. Yes. So do me a favor. Next time you talk to her, tell them we're pulling for her and keep her chin up. Um, cause that's just a sad story. And also people listening to us behind enemy lines in the uh, state of California, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to write an email to your state representative. It doesn't hurt to write an email to your state Senator, to your federal representatives and let them know you're paying attention and this is bothering you. This is not okay. Uh, even if you don't think 
they read this stuff, someone does read this stuff. And if you get enough of them, it does make a difference. I know it seems naive of me to say, but it does make a difference. You write to your representatives and let them know how you feel about this. Of course, be respectful, be polite, uh, but let them know this is this is not at all cool. All right, folks, I got to get going. Uh, the, the the work crew in my almost finished house is kind of about to start working again. They're finished their bologna sandwiches, and I see them picking up hammers as we speak. So I got to let you go. If you are lamenting the lack of down the middle, sane, sober reporting on the Second Amendment and all things gun related, like this story that I hadn't heard until Stephen brought it to my attention, do me a favor, go over to thereload.com, thereload.com, and consider getting a membership. Stephen relies on your uh your dollars to fund his important work i don't know anyone else is doing what he's doing so go over there and check it out and steven uh buddy always a pleasure to see you and uh, we'll see you next week god willing absolutely hey friends this is john korea if you like the podcast if it is bringing you value do me a favor leave us a rating and a review it really helps us out 